Hello, guys. In this episode of The Happy Doc, I'm not going to belabor the introduction, uh, but I literally just recorded with Dr. Neil Desai, and I do a little intro of him in the episode, so you guys will hear that. Um, But I wanted to review some of the awesome things we talked about in this episode, and I know you're going to enjoy it. I think it's just whatever field you're in, um, whatever, whatever, whatever the specialty professional uh, field that you're in, um, whether you're a medical student, resident, PT school, doesn't have you. A lot of the things we talk about are pretty universal through the process of any prep professional or graduate training. For those who are a little further along, I know we have a lot of, um, you know, fully fledged professionals that listen, you know, it's just so important to be cognizant of the transition points um, and what people are going through through the process of training. So, um, you know, with all that being said, here are some of the things we talk about um, in this episode. We talk about the USMLE, which is our um, licensing exam for medical education and how they switch that to pass fail. Um, and, you know, kind of looking at that a little bit. We talked about knowing knowns versus unknowns in life. We discussed um, adapting and adjusting um, when changes happen in our life. Um, And Neil, you know, really provides a really good example of that um, with um, osteogenesis imperfecta. We talk about the idea of perspective and looking at things from different perspectives um, and dealing with life how it is. Uh, We talk about a little bit about dealing with things um, in the past and the future and how we come back to the present moment um, to really tackle different ideas. Um, we also talk about the importance of understanding the investment that we all make when we go into a professional field and dealing with the discomfort of, you know, training for so long and then coming out of the other end with different options, opportunities, and how things kind of, you know, we've been in a box for so long that things change in a different direction, what that transition is like. So with all that being said, I hope you enjoyed the episode. I had a lot of fun recording with Neil, uh, and I'll see you on the next episode of The Happy Doc. Have a good one, guys. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Happy Doc. This is Dr. Taylor Brana, and with me today is uh, none other than Neil Desai. Um, so we're going to hop into a pretty fun reflection episode. Uh, we're going to talk about lots of stuff, lots of updates, how we're doing. Um, and we're really excited to record this. We thought it'd be super fun to do. Um, so Neil Desai is a family medicine physician. He's also passionate about osteogenesis imperfecta. And uh, definitely uh, in the future, he wants to open up an OI clinic if you guys haven't heard of all of that in the previous episodes. Um, so we'll, we'll get into a lot of stuff, but Neil, you want to just say hi and introduce yourself? Yeah. What's up listeners? How's it going? Uh, glad to be here and, uh, we're ready to get into it. Awesome. And so if you guys don't know, Neil's basically been with me since day one of the happy doc podcast. Um, and basically you've been with me even before I started (laughs) residency. So, yeah, yeah, it's been interesting. Yeah, because <laughs> I seen you grown, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Here. Like you, you've known me since since like the ending of medical school, which is really interesting because I think even at that point, now that I'm like talking about it, like at that point, I was like hesitant of what I wanted to do because I was in a weird space and I was trying to do the podcast. And I was like, should I even go into residency? You remember yeah. that whole thing? Like I was like yeah. so reluctant. Yeah. The, the funny thing is, but that's where I thought that there was something special there because, you know, a lot of people, and we can get into this a little later, but for me, it's like, oh shit, like he's early on in the process. He hasn't been brainwashed yet. So like, and now it's like before this kid gets like brainwashed, like let's get him like out of the matrix and like, hopefully we can go on a different path. And that's what I thought was a very unique uh, situation and timing. And I'm like, we can try something different here because usually what a lot of people in our space that do these podcasts about quote unquote burnout or moral injury or whatever, it's usually after the fact that like they've gone through a while, kind of like me, where as opposed to you, you were just starting the process. I think this is what we get into is like where we are in the process now and how we've evolved and learned and grown. What do you mean by, what do you mean by brainwashing? So let's like, when you you say, no, no, but for real, like, like, let's spell it out. What do you mean by brainwashing? Like, what what, what do you see? Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of being a little facetious with with saying brainwashing. What I mean by that is a certain way of thinking, like, uh, 
a lot of our guests, and this is something looking back now, if you look, go through episodes of our, our interviews uh, and, stuff, and stuff, people that I've written about, common theme is like, there's a certain way of like thinking in medicine, like, and it trains you to, to behave a certain way and think a certain way, which has its uh, merits in certain ways. When you're, when you're doing medicine, you got to be overly cautious and, and be, you know, kind of like be very, very thoughtful about it. But at the same time, it, it at, at sometimes it's at the expense of sucking like your creativity out of you and doing things outside the box because that is considered a threat to the system and then you are told not to do that and that is a thing whereas what we're learning is like what i'm learning at least is that it's more a threat to stay in the system in today's day and age and environment and landscape right. and people who are going outside the box are thriving whereas people who are in this in the box are stagnating that's my yeah. insight yeah. And, and I actually like wrote about this recently, but it's like, um, you know, I, and we talked about, we talk about this at length a lot, but it's like the linear versus nonlinear path. Um, I, I, I hear what you're saying. We actually talked about this yesterday too, but the whole idea when you, when you think about how we've been trained since we were kids that we, you know, we go to elementary school, we go to middle, middle school, we go to high school, we go to college, we go to you know, grad school or med school, and then we go into residency, everything's been in boxes this whole time of how you live your life. Um, and it's just like, when you live your life like that, it's always checking the next box. Um, but what is it like when you don't have that box anymore? What is it like when you um, are trying to figure out what you want to do, and there is no structure? Um, and it's a very different world. And it's like, uh, what I wrote about yesterday was this idea that there's different levels to your awareness and what you can do with it. So level one is you're dependent on other people. You're dependent on external circumstances for your happiness. Level two is being independent, looking inside of yourself to really figure out what it is that you want, what you choose, what you decide. And I feel like for most people, for a lot of people, um, unless this is really 100% what you want, uh, many people are dependent on those structures to give them validation, to give them a sense of, you know, joy, a sense of fulfillment. And so when, you know, when we talk about burnout, if those structures like your hospital, your tending or, you know, your relationship you're in or whatever, if you're not getting the validation there, then it's like, crap, what's the point of all of this, you know? So I think we've definitely you know, learn to be in that stage too, which is more independent through things like podcasting and through creativity. Um, and I think we've definitely learned a lot through that. Yeah. And just to give a practical example, recently, uh, we were just talking about this, the USMLE step one went from score three digit scoring to a pass fail system. So people that were like used to like using that as a measurement of like where they were in the process now don't have that. So this is a, another thing that we talk about is like adapting to new paradigms. And if you are in a fixed way, oh shit, like now what am I going to do? You know, I was yeah. like, you know, cause this is something I personally experienced myself. My class, I think I talked about this before, but my class was the last one to take the old step one. And then we were the first class, which was on the paper booklet. It's a two day exam, like, you know, all day and for two days. And, and then the next, and then we were the first class to take the step two on the computer. So right. that transition was, it was difficult, but at the same time, it was like, if you don't learn those skills and how to adapt to these things, then you can get stuck in the box. And that's part of like, that's why you're having a lot of, seeing a lot of people have a lot of uh, conflict with this. It's a dis big discussion. Like, you know, whether they're, I talk to medical students right now who are taking it like this year or next year. Right. And they're like, we're and like, and they're like, what do I do with this? And like, I'm just curious, what's your thoughts on this? Like, yeah, and just in general about pass bail and just how our audience can listen if they're studying or yeah, how do they deal with this? Well, so I think, I think regardless, uh, you know, when it comes to like the pass fail for US, USMLE or if you're in a DO school, um, I think it's just for the USMLE right now. The Comlex hasn't changed, I don't believe. But so for DOs, it might be a little different, but. Um, eventually I, I do know they're considering, you know, whether there's, they're going to be merging those exams, but anyways, so there's always going to have to be something that differentiates. There's always going to have to be something that differentiates people, right? Because if you switch mm -hmm. to pass fail on the USMLE, 
the other thing you know you have to think about is then what is going to be the differentiator so for me personally i would have loved a pass fail because i I tend (laughs) i tend not to be as strong on standardized exams it's just not the the (laughs) way it's not the way i think it's not the way i often you know look at things but i i I think the pass fail obviously is an attempt to lower the pressure and the stress of the exam and just say, look, you just need to be competent. Um, and wherever you go, you'll learn what you need to learn. Um, so I, I think it's a definitely a good, um, you know, model of thinking around it. I just, I'm very curious what's going to happen. Um, you know, after the fact in my head, what's probably going to differentiate people then is going to be those things like, how, how'd you do on your clinical rotations? What are your recommendation letters? Like, um, they might try to differentiate you. I don't know if there's going to be maybe for some people who, or some universities or groups that still want to be competitive, may they, might they in create their own in, um, you know, uh, residency exam to weed people out. I have no idea what's going to happen, but I, I think, I think, um, you know, there's still going to have to be a way that people get differentiated. It's at some mm-hmm. level. Um, my hope is that how it differentiates people is they take, you know, programs taken people they like and trust and enjoy and, and feel that is a good fit for the program instead of looking at the numbers. Yeah. Um, so that's obviously the hope. Um, I, I know I would have personally preferred the pass fail. Um, but, um, another way to look at it though, actually is when we're talking about differentiation is it actually might penalize people that fail, um, even more because now they don't have another number to, they don't have a number to say how close you were. Um, and when they have all these people passing, you know, so I don't know, I'm, uh, I'm curious to see what happens. Um, and another, it'll be interesting. Yeah, so another angle to this that I want, because I think you would give a good insight, and I have a little bit of insight to this, is when things change all of a sudden, how do you deal with the unknown? Like we were just talking about, like we don't know a lot. A lot of us during, like we we're just you're just talking about earlier, like you have a certain box that you have to check. You know, you have certain knowns. Mm-hmm. And a lot of what we're dealing with, with our process and doing what we're doing, we're dealing with a lot of unknowns, but yet we're getting comfortable in the known. Because I always say that's, a lot of time, if you have the courage to go out in the known, that's where the good stuff is. That's where the good shit, that's like, if you're willing to put, try that and create right. some stuff, you know? Um, what about for students or how do they, what, as like your background, how would you recommend they deal with like that kind of uncertainty, fear, insecurity, and of not knowing what's going to happen? Yeah. So the unknowns versus knowns. I mean, so right. It depends on the level of the game that you're in. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. because you know, when you're in medical school, so when you're in college, your unknowns versus knowns of what you're looking to get to are obviously like, you know, if you're pre-med, you're like, can't, what medical school am I going to get into? Can I even get in? Right. Then you get into med school and then it's like, when, when you're there, the unknowns versus knowns are, am I going to get into a match, right? Mm-hmm. So at the medical school level, um, how do you deal with that? The, the way I dealt with it and the way I think everyone needs to deal with, because at the end of the day, like, I mean, again, I'm not the oldest person, but I, I've learned and I've read and I've heard from many other people about their wisdom. And, and the main wisdom is, is you're, in life, you will always not know the next steps, And Mm -hmm. the only thing that we can do when it comes to that is two things. Number one is realize that you will never have your life 100% in control. It's just not possible because we live in a system on this planet that I I can't control the fact if a meteor strikes Philadelphia right now. I can't control the fact if like, you know, some driver decides to swerve on the road when I'm being a conscientious person. I can't control those things. So what can I, so one thing is to accept the discomfort that is life. Um, And then number two is what we talked about earlier, which is control all the variables that you can in your independent power to try to make things as smooth as possible. So when it comes to like, you know, this transition from medical school to residency, do the best you can on rotations, do the best you can to study, do the best that you can to do well on your boards, do the best you can to 
let the programs know how authentic your desire is to get in. Let let people know who you are and put your best foot forward. I think the people that live in regrets are the ones that, you know, look back and say, I didn't really put my best foot forward. I didn't take those chances. I didn't, you know, I wasn't being myself. Um, and then now that I'm in residency, right? Like I was talking to you about this yesterday, Neil, mm-hmm. like yeah. now I'm starting to see the other end of the tunnel where I have a lot of options, an incredible amount of options. And that's also daunting. So we, every end of the spectrum, you have knowns and unknowns and it can be incredibly scary. And you just gotta, you gotta do your research. You gotta be the best you that you can be. Um, not be so hard if you've made a wrong deci- decision. Know that you can p- you can pivot or try something else if one direction doesn't work. Um, and uh, and trust the process because at the end of the day, um, life is really open and scary, uh, yeah. and it's hard on everyone. And I want to I really want to highlight that because uh, whatever decision we make at the end of the day sometimes it's kind of ambiguous if you made the right decision or not. And that's kind of weird and it's scary and it's uncomfortable. Yeah. Just to give my two cents on from my end of the spectrum. So this, I can draw it like our experience with Keith and my son who has OI uh, with his fractures. So one of the things that we did is like, we, he's going to fracture. That's just part of the, that's part of the deal. Yeah. Uh, our thing is with the school is like, what could we do to create a safer environment? How can we be proactive? it's all about adapting to new situations and new adversities and then kind of like anticipating and adapt, adapting and then and being proactive to create new paths. That's what we was talking about creating new paths. And that's what we kind of did. It's like, there was no blueprint for this. Like, you know, we were just kind of yeah. making up as it went along, but we created safe environments. And then the thing is that the school calls, it's like, Oh, he, he fractured or he hurt his, he fell or something it's one of those things that like we can get upset, but at the same time, after a while, you just learn this is just part of the deal. Yeah. There's going to, like you were saying, there are going to be challenges. You're going to have changes. You're going to, you're never in hundred percent control, but you control, you focus on the variables you can control and try to make those environments, try to think ahead, anticipate, and then you adapt and then you create a unique plan for that. And you try to stick to it. And then you stick to that process, but you don't get upset if it doesn't go hundred percent because you're going to have bumps you don't, you don't beat yourself up over it too. Yeah. You just kind of like, it's that learning. Like, you know, if you don't, if you, it's like when we learn in medicine, it's like you, you lose a patient or you make a mistake. We have, that's why you have M&Ms. That's why we have discussions. That's what we talk all the time. Dude, like why what did I do wrong here? Yeah. You know, like, and you just say, what can I learn? What would I do yeah. different next time? And don't dwell on the past or what happened. Just learn from it and kind of move forward. And I think yeah. there's, that's why a lot of what we talk about is creating new paths, adapting, and um, yeah, just kind of being health, like healthy kind of mindset. No, I want to, I want to speak to that a little bit. So like, like giving the example of the fractures, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, that whether you like it or not, you know, some with osteogenesis imperfecta is going to have fractures. They're more, you know, they're more predisposable. There's going to be something that happens with OI and that person, you know, is going to eventually fracture. Well, to make it like a little bit bigger, like in life, whether I like it or not, I'm going to fracture. I'm going to fracture in my spirit. I'm going to fracture in like my, um, you know, my motivation. I'm going to fracture, fracture in my plans. Like something's going to fracture for me. Right. And it's like, Mm -hmm. I, I, that's going to happen, but I, I, you know, I deal with a lot of people with depression and anxiety and the, when it comes to the thinking behind it, depression is often dwelling in the past. It's letting things weigh you down. Anxiety is often looking towards the future and like trying to plan for a future and stressing out about what could or won't happen and this and that. And it just like, when are we in the present moment? Like at the end of the day, it's going to happen, but does that take away from the fact that I, I can't enjoy what is going on now? Um, what is happening right now in my immediate experience? Like, am I enjoying, you know, my, me, me enjoying the fact that I get the, the opportunity to be a resident? Do I enjoy the fact that I get the opportunity to um, have a physical body that gets to work and has an occupation? Do I have the opportunity to enjoy the process of doing a podcast? Do I enjoy the opportunity of living in an area where I'm overall safe, have food on the table and all of that stuff? And I think when you look at it from that lens, it's like, 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm not fracturing every minute. You know, we're, yeah. we're, an, we're anticipating the failure instead of yeah. just like being in the moment and enjoying the process of what's happening. I know that's really easier said than done, but that, that's the yeah. truth of the matter. So, is, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So, and what you're also talking about is what I talk about every, I think to myself, every, it's about perspective because literally like, having a good perspective and how you look. So for me, my perspective is like, is my family healthy? Is Ethan like, is he doing well? Like, even if he fractures, because we've gotten to the point so much. Yeah, okay, we, we've handled it. We're, we're like, we're veterans at it now at this point. After 10 years, he's going to be 11. And it's like, he's done well, but like, he's going to have broken bones, whatever. But like, but the fact is he, you know, I always go back to that first story I told you. I was like, there was that initial story that he was not supposed to live. And I go back to that day, sitting in the room of the perinatologist telling us, this is a fatal condition. Your son's going to die, asphyxiate in utero. And there's nothing you can do. And I'm like, so on the opposite side, every day that he wakes up and he's doing fine, or like, may have a broke, but he's doing okay. That's a blessing. I'm like, we're good, you know? Yeah. And it all kind of like, so after that, anything is like minor compared to that. I mean, it's, it's powerful, right? Like yeah. he was essentially sentenced to death. Yeah. And now it's like every day he lives, it's like, ha ha, gotcha. You know what I mean? In your <laughs> face. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's why I always tell you like, to, like, I, like when we, when we were doing these creative things, it's like for us, I think a big insight and, um, for me is like when you're starting a podcast or a blog to kind of get for anyone that's out there's listening, it's like one thing, if you want to start something, it's like, it helps if you have a strong emotional connection to it. Cause that will help you sustain you through like those periods where you may feel kind of like, eh, you may like lack motivation it's like yeah but if you have something that like that north star like that strong emotional connection for you like it was with the podcast like when you were just kind of like do i really want to do this yeah. you know and you're at that down point that kind of nadir that kind of like low point for yeah. me it was like you know ethan i was like but i'm like but now it's more like every, that drives and fuels a lot of what we're doing so i think there's something to be said for having that strong emotional connection to create your own path and tying those marrying those things to kind of do and then figure out how you communicate. And that's something that we're seeing over and over again that people are doing that really are thriving and successful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it just, it just makes, yeah. I mean, that's, that's everything right there is, is that process of mm -hmm. that process of having that perspective. Yeah. Um, and and speaking noticing. Of, mm -hmm. Sorry. Speaking yep. of the process. So I'm always, I always love these conversations because watching you grow, actually myself grow too. Like, so you're now almost finishing your third year of re psychiatry residency, right? Yep. And you started this as a third year medical student. Yep. So for the students, I guess from how, what lessons would you tell, like, what lessons have you learned in general? Like, I know there's a lot, but like, no, yeah, so yeah. Much, you know, like, I mean, I think a lot of residents want to know this, a lot of intern, like, how can we give value to our listeners? Not only, not only the residents, but I think the, I think the attendings also yeah. should listen to this and, totally. and, and even medical students, because so first and foremost at each, for me, each step of the game, you know, I'm calling the game, the process of, the process, of, yeah. of this whole thing each step of the game requires a different level of um, action and behavior and thought process. Um, you know, whether I like it or not, one of the reasons I started the podcast was because I was freaking out about boards and I'd never been that anxious and I was starting to feel depressed and down and all this stuff. And you know what, honestly, now that I look back, that was not a bad thing. It was a good thing that I was stressed and anxious. It meant that I cared. It meant that I wanted to work hard. It meant that it was super tough, but you don't want to let that overwhelm you, right? So there's obviously a balance there. So at, at different stages of the game, you know, a lot of people are going to say like, oh, how dare this system do that to me, this and that. Well, on one end, yes, we should probably work on trying to find ways for it to be less stressful. On the other end, though, there's a reason why you're freaking out. You are freaking out because you've been working so hard for this for, you know, 25, 30 plus years of your life, however old you are. And this this exam does determine a lot, you know, and so you should be freaking out. And it's it's understandable that you're freaking out. It under you've been working. This is the moment, you know. So, um, you know, so that's kind of that mentality. And at the end of the day, you do have to do what's right for you. You do have to find those resources and all those things, you know. So that's that transition into that board's life kind of thing. When you're in, you're going into clinical rotations. At least, you know, I'll speak for myself. Again, like. 
it's a different phase. Now you're auditioning. Now you're now you're being a good person. Now you're going into the thing that you wanted to do. You know, for me, the thing I wanted to do. And to be honest, I didn't think I was going to go into psychiatry. Right? Like I thought I was going to go into family medicine or peds or maybe emergency. Um, and then I went on psych, and I was like, oh, I got to actually talk to people for a longer period of time. And so I think what I've learned, you know, from that end is don't predict what it is that you love, just start to try and then you'll fall into what you love. Um, and you don't have to, everyone's trying so hard to figure it out preemptively. Um, but life is experiential. And so you can't know, everyone's trying to cognitively figure out what they want to do, but you can't know what you don't know. So you have to try in order to experientially, uh, figure out what is for you. So that's what, what I would say for, you know, medical students trying to, sp you know, pick specialties. There's so much more about that. But for me, that's kind of how it was for me. Then matching. Matching was a crazy process. I was freaking out. Um, to be honest, I didn't have many interviews. I, um, I've talked about this on the podcast. I failed step two and that limited a lot of my options. So for anyone who's in that position, it's even more important that you do super well on your clinical rotations. And so for me, I try to kill my clinical rotations. I woke up early. I was very active. I was engaged. I let my you know, preceptors and my uh, fellow residents know how much I wanted this. Um, I was really authentic about it. I was not BSing. I really did want to you know, do well and to perform well as a physician. And it really, it really showed. I mean, I, I think that was one of the comments I got was how passionate I was. And I think for anyone who's worked so hard... You know, my tip would be to not in an over over the top way, but in an authentic way, show your passion. Like you went into this for a reason, and honestly, Neil, I know how it is for you. Yeah. Like when you work with medical students, how awesome is it? When um, how awesome is it when you see a student that's passionate and like that reignites your fire? I'm sure, right? Definitely, hundred percent. So it, it's just, a, it's just that passion is so important. And like, you know, a lot, especially for people who have been doing it for a while and they're burnt down, they're exhausted. I think we forget how much we've learned. We forget yeah. how much we have left to give, how much we have to teach. And, and so there's that physician student relationship that's born. And like, so an excited student, it gives us excite, excitement and I'm still a student too. So it's, you know, it's a whole spectrum. Oh my. <laughs> right. So <laughs> we all are. <laughs> Intern year is crazy because you go back from, you know, thinking you kind of know stuff to literally now you're, you're, I remember the first experience was my first day on the emergency department. Um, I'm working there and um, uh, my attending and myself, we decide we have to give this patient a medication and I put in the order for the IV. And I literally, I remember there, I'm sitting at the computer because now it's all computers. I click on the order for the IV and I literally watched the nurse walk over and put the IV in. And I was like, how surreal is this? This is like a video game right now. I like <laughs> clicked it and they went in and, and that's kind of, but the truth is, is like you, now I, I was, that was my name in on that IV and that experience, that shift was so huge for me because up until then I was like, you know, presenting in front of the attendings. I was doing this, I was doing that, but I never actually made a decision that affected someone's life. And in that moment, that IV went inside someone. And so that was a huge shift. And I think that's the shift in responsibility as you go into residency, which is uh, what you think and what you say and what you do matters. Up until med in medical school, that responsibility is not there. And so that shift is very important for uh, residents to understand. It's also very important for attendings to understand because attendings, you know, and higher, you know, seniors might forget we're so used to just making orders. Yep. We don't realize how scary it is for someone who's just transitioning to make those orders. So yeah. it's very, so that's like a very confidence building phase. Now in my, you know, second and third year, I would say I'm on the better section of my residency. It's, it does get better there. I, I will say that you know, and Neil, I was talking to you about this yesterday. It's like, now that I have a little bit more free play and a little bit more time, it's really strange because I'm so used to being busy all the time and really <laughs> working crazy hours and I'm still working heavy hours, but because I'm so used to the 80 hour work weeks, you know, now that I'm dropping into 40, 50, 60 hour work weeks, sometimes 70 still, 
But now that I have those extra 10 hours, those extra 20 hours, it's weird. Yeah, and, totally weird. And we, <laughs> were, ta- we were talking yeah. about those yeah. box. We were talking about those boxes and, and how you have this linear mm-hmm. path. I've been so trained to work hard. What do I do when, yeah. when no, I delegate like, more? Yes, yeah, so this is actually, so I can speak more from the attending side because I've been yeah. attending for 16 years now and been in pre- been a doctor for 20 years so it's like like you're saying this is just at another level especially when after your children start to grow up a little bit and then like so for me lately Ethan's like he's it's no longer relying a lot on us like when he was younger now he's kind of getting older preteen he's kind of doing his own thing with his friends and stuff and it's just weird because they're like you you had all these things and plans and busy you know and then all of a sudden and all these things that you had to do now all of a sudden here's all this time and you, you know, you, and that's like, wait, now what, <laughs> now what I do, you know, it's like, it's, it's strange. It's like, cause you're, you're talking about it. Like you have everything planned for you. And there's like certain things and box, check this box, do this, do this list. Right. Now it's like open, like, and there's no instruction manual or yeah. no guidebook. And you're like, Oh shit. Now like, now what do I do? Which yeah. is not bad. It's not a bad thing, but it's just strange. Cause you're like, and that's why then you, that's why now you have to go back to like wait who was I before I started school and then I'm like and then it's like now oh I gotta pick up the guitar again I gotta yeah. start writing like you know go play basketball or swim or like you know go uh, do some self learning or, or, or hang out with friends and do things I used to do <laughs> like yeah and that's it, it's, it's like it's you so put things strange. on pause you know and you're like and that's part of that mindset where like I said like the brainwash I was like. So then what I called it, like we were talking, yeah, I use this term, I was like, it's like deprogramming again. You're like yeah. getting back into your, well, this it's, it's, space. it's really weird because, you know, I think, you know, success is, you know, how successful you are in life is also defined by the decisions I think you make. So there, I mean, we talk about this a lot, but like compounding interest, mm-hmm. compound decisions. So being a medical student and, you know, going through this process is really, really hard and a lot of times it feels like slavery or it feels like, you know, this ridiculous process, but it's a compounding decision because once you have that DO or MD at the end of your name, it comes with a lot of power and that compounding that all that hard work that we put in with those 80 hour weeks um, and sleepless nights and all of that training, it comes with benefits that you can't imagine until you're here and until you mm-hmm. have that opportunity Um, and, and so now, like now that I see that opportunity, you know, I'm still, you know, relatively, I mean, I'm still very young. Um, I can technically work anywhere in the United States. Like I can do a lot with my specialty. Um, it's so open and the opportunities I can write a book, I can keep doing the Mm -hmm. podcasting. We're building out some businesses. You can do so much with your specialization. You can do so much with your knowledge that, mm-hmm. you know, now I'm absolutely grateful for how shitty and how terrible yeah. that process was, yeah. but it's just, it's, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird thing to go through such rigorous training. Um, and honestly, it's not even as rigorous as it used to be, but no, it's a weird, I did it. <laughs> so, I mean, it was way harder for you. So yeah. it's a weird thing to go through rigorous training and, um, now have that opportunity to open up to the world. And like, you're talking about, like, I was like, I have a lot more free time now. Like I need to pick up piano again. I need to do this, but like, it's, it's a really strange transition to have all of those boxes you need to check. And now it's kind of like, there's not many more boxes. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So, but this is why we talk about it all the time. Like, or you hear about being doc, like, you know, our friend, Nate Dark, like, being a doc outside the box or like, that's why you're seeing like a lot of these things kind of doctors do these side things or, or, but I I feel like there's something to that, that like people are rediscovering their, their their humanity and their creativity. And and that's what gets them fulfilled and energized. You ask people all the time, what gets them excited? What gets them energized? Right. And this is that kind of like, I have a thesis that like, well, it's not a thesis. Like we've heard people say the training sucks the creative energy out of you. But what happens is when you have that awakening, you're like, but it's usually a catalyst is some kind of low point or tragic event or something 
that catalyst, you hit that, and then you're like, and then you reflect, and then you adjust and adapt, and then you start creating something new. And that that creative energy is like a compounding effect. Uh, you're saying too, yeah. um, you know what I mean? But it's well, it's, it's crazy. It's, <laughs> it's strange though because you know we talk often about how the medical system is very soul sucking, and you know the process of getting to that next step is very soul sucking. Um, and honestly, if it takes longer than you think it can be. So, you know, when you're younger or when you're a child or as you're growing up, you kind of have a lot more free play and that creativity and you can be yourself and all that stuff. But when you enter more rigorous training, it's like, oh, now I'm supposed to be this. I'm supposed to train. I'm supposed to Mm -hmm. study. And I think a lot of people lose themselves in that process. And then I think it's almost like an identity crisis in a way. It's like, who am, who am I now, now that I finished all of this, you know? It's or it's like, like you're groomed to be like, to play, like I say this all the time, like you're groomed to play a certain position in a game. Yeah. Like, like that's why I say, like, like for me, it's only recent, like, oh, why was I groomed to be shortstop for the baseball team when I was, it turned out the whole time I was a point guard for the basketball team. But I had to figure it out. The problem is you're doing what everyone, uh, what you think you should do or what everyone tells you you should do. Yeah. And you get lost in the shoulds this is because that's what people do. You should do that. You yeah. know? And then you're like, but then you get like this misalignment and this identity crisis. And you're like, why do I feel like angst and un- yeah. un- edgy? You're like, this is it. And I'm like, but then it's like, but then you have this trend and that re- makes you, it kind of reboots the system. And mm-hmm. you're like, you take a step out of the matrix and you're like, oh shit. Like, and you see everything because it makes you re-examine everything. And you're like, just not just your medical training, but your whole life as a whole relationships, business, all this stuff, mm-hmm. your emotional, mental, physical, mind, uh, my uh, health, all this other stuff. And then you're like, oh, wait a second. And then you really get clear. I'm like, that's what I like. That's And then you kind of, and then once you get clear on what you like and what you like to do, it's having that self-awareness. Because a lot of us, I think we kind of push that self-awareness or just self-awareness down to be like, to, to to please other people because i think as a whole we tend to be people pleasers or rule followers and it's like going against the grain is like that just threatens us or scares us you know what i mean yeah i mean with the whole people pleasing thing i talk about this all the time i mean yeah. because ever so you know the medical field attracts people that like to give to other people at the expense of themselves right so i mean i i could go on ad nauseum about this but essentially you know, while you're people pleasing, who's pleasing you? Are you giving exactly. yourself what you need? Are, and, and there's a difference. And I feel like often what happens is we've become the caregiver role for so long. We haven't, we haven't remembered what it is that we want, what we desire. And what we desire is incredibly important because um, if you're not able to fill your own personal cup, and you're giving from an empty cup, well, what happens is your spirit, your life, your, you know, everything gets drained. And then you blame and resent everyone when really it was your problem to begin with because you didn't work on yourself and what you wanted. Yeah, it's like the oxygen, put your oxygen mask on first. But the thing is also, it's not going to be cured by like one little thing of like doing yoga or a wellness module or something like that. Here's the thing, you you could, we could go on about that. But the thing is, like, the system's not going to make you better. You got to do it yourself. And you got to figure out. The other thing is, Taylor knows, like, just you, me, Taylor knows if he has to go rock climbing or do, you know, gymnastics or whatever, that gets him, like, and here's the thing. Everyone thinks, like, well, it has to be for several hours. That's not necessarily true. Even if you could do, like, something, listening to a podcast or writing or doing something, even if you do it for five minutes, it's like I tell uh, patients, you want to lose a lot of weight, start with just doing five minutes a day, you know? Yeah. It's five minutes is better than zero. And then, and like, but that five minutes is putting five minutes into you, investment in yourself. And it's that's it's an energy bank that will keep your creativity and your physical, mental, emotional health, like at least as a, like a buffer or like a protection, uh, doing something and find different activities that you can put in that bank, whether it's like listening to a podcast or an audio book or writing or, playing uh for me playing the guitar for five minutes like just even a couple of minutes is better than i think time is a big thing we in our field we don't really know very we're not very good with time management a lot like if we had more uh time um literacy that might help a little bit like i mean that that is a whole can of worms like it's funny because we we've done so much of this work now that every topic is has so much depth and richness Mm -hmm. to it so 
Um, so for the sake of speaking of time, for the sake yeah. of time, mm -hmm. uh, Neil and I decided before we recorded this that we would actually try to keep it to around 40, uh, 40 minutes or so because um, we can literally talk about stuff for hours. Yeah. Um, and we also understand that we wanted to make it really um, applicable to you. So um, I, I think I think that we did a pretty good job kind of reviewing and reflecting on kind of that process of mm -hmm. training and some of the stuff we've learned. I, I'm sure we're going to record um, again to talk about more business concepts and time management concepts and all of that stuff in the near future. Um, but I think we'll cut it there. Uh, Neil, did you have any other like finishing thoughts or anything else you'd add? Uh, just try, I, there's one thing I learned. I think we both learned, Taylor and I both learned. It's like, stop, uh, learn to not overjudge yourself because the biggest thing, you know, the worst, that the, the, the worst, the voices we listen to really determine like our actions, especially the voices in our head. So make sure that we get those voices clear and make sure they're supportive. And I think that's really important to get. We always talk about mindset. It's like having those correct, getting quiet in your head, peaceful, and having the voices to kind of take, to give you the right actions. Yeah. And, and, and I would, I would add on to this. If the voices are negative or stressful and all that stuff, um, you know, that's one piece of feedback just look into yourself to figure it out, figure out or seek mentorship or talk, talk to see a therapist, whatever you need to do to talk it out with someone to look at reality as it is. Because oftentimes when we're, we're in a dark place, the voices or the you know, negative thoughts, of other people affect us more. Um, but that's not reality. That's not truth. That's just a, that's your limited perspective based on the situation that you're in. Um, and it's, and thoughts are, Voices, thoughts, they're just thoughts. They don't have a direct impact on you, positive or negative. Um, and, and sometimes it's not always going to be positive. Sometimes it's going to be a little dark. Sometimes you're going to have nightmares. Sometimes you're not going to feel good. Um, and that's okay. And it's okay to also feel fantastic and to be okay and in the present moment of that process. I know that's a little bit like maybe um, hard to always understand, like, how can I be okay with my negative thoughts? But it's important to cultivate that feeling that you can acknowledge and accept where you're at. Um, I won't go too deep into that, but I, I think that's a great, you know, place for us to kind of, uh, you know, stop for today. And Neil, that was a great point on trying not to just judge yourself um, and work, working through that process. So we'll cut it there and then we'll oh. go on to a new episode um, in the near future. So I want to thank everyone for listening and I'll see you guys on the next episode. And I will add, if you loved the episode for today, please um, share it with your friends, you know, whether you're in medical training or you think someone in a professional field would enjoy this, share it with whomever you think would like it. And um, if you're loving the podcast, leave us a five-star review um, on iTunes or whatever platform you're listening to, because it definitely helps a lot. Um, and thank you guys. Thanks. Later guys.